Am I first? Ten, ten, first. ten oh. to the red to um, uh, Okay, we'll get ready to get underway for, for photojournalism night. Um, first, our announcements. Well, let me just bring up our Friday announcements and we'll get underway. Okay, coming up next Friday, uh, again, we have a Zoom. The clubhouse will be open. Um, as well as if, when you get your Zoom invite, all members are sent the Zoom invite. You could watch from home. We've got Joe Edelman back again. He gave us a three for two. We paid for two, three for two. We paid for two lectures and we got three for him uh, over the coming year. Um, the reason we paid premium is Joe is a really, really good speaker um, as well. So a very, very knowledgeable. Uh, DIY photo accessories on a budget, that'll be next week. And remember the Zoom presentations, it'll be open here in the clubhouse. You can participate, you can um, look from home. And if you miss it too, you could sign into the website at any time afterwards. I put it up under the members content. 
So it'll be up there permanently. So that's coming up next Friday, Joe Edelman. March 1st will be our creative competition again, which will be a print competition. So the deadline is that evening. And while the judges are judging the print competition, since they're judged that night, we have to fill time. So I'll be talking on photographing the kingdom of Jordan. I just come back from Jordan. We'll talk about gear, what kind of photographic situations we got into over there, how to, these type of things as well. So that's before the competition next week. The week after, uh, March 8th, a B competition again, which will be projection. Following that, the next Friday is another photojournalism night. It'll be our last one of the season. I encourage everyone to participate. Photojournalism, which is run by Mariah Kaiser uh, over here. Photojournalism is a great night um, because it's not a competition. However, things that you enter, there's a year-end award for the best photojournalism. You could enter one of them at the year end. But that night, we're not judging. It's a way for you to really just tell a story, describe your pictures. You could enter up to seven pictures, too. They don't have to be photojournalistic in the sense of a news item. It's anything that tells a story. Um, again, so that will be our last photojournalism night, which is also projection, and that will be on March 15th. Our next SIG meeting coming up with Dave Bush, uh, March 7th, continuous shooting. He's going to go through all the different methods of continuous shooting, not just the burst shooting, but time lapse, dynamic range optimization, stacking images, um, uh, all of those items together. And then, of course, we'll break up into individual uh, camera groups, Sony, Nikon, etc., cetera, um, to discuss camera issues. That's coming up um, Thursday, March 7th. And we are kicking off this weekend. You're going to be at, everyone at home is going to be getting an email. You're going to be seeing it on the weekly snapshot. Um, I am starting an ad campaign for positions needed, volunteer positions at CPS. There are three that we really need someone to come into. And then there are all kinds of others to fill, depending on how much time you want to put in. So there's a lot more information going to be coming out about this. Um, we are looking for a co-director of the Fundamentals of Good Photography um, to run our school. Uh, this is all administrative. It's not lecturing. Um, it's setting up the school, setting up schedules. All of these things, we c it can be done from home. So there's not like you have to put a lot of time in. And we're looking for a co-director, which means you'll be splitting it with someone else. The second position we'd like to fill is a speaker coordinator. This club runs on speakers, getting Joe Edelman and all of these others. Um, Kim Vasilewski uh, does this now for us and does a great job um, before her. Uh, Chuck Fitzgerald did it. And it, again, it's a great job. It's all done at home. It's a matter of just finding people all over the country on websites, whatnot, getting in touch with them, getting things coordinated. Uh, again, Kim will teach you everything, but we need a, a speaker coordinator. And the third is co-chair of our competitions committee. The competitions committee is in charge of running all of the competitions. Now, each competition also has its own chair. There's a chair of black and white, a chair of photojournalism. Um, however, this is the head of the whole the whole Megillah there uh, as well. We're co-chair, so two people are running it, so it's a little easier to do. Um, again, a complete description is going to be sent out to everyone, so you'll hear a lot more uh, than that. So depending on how much time you want to put in, we're also looking for instructors in our schools. If you have an area of expertise, anything uh, that you have, portrait photography, some other type of night photography, uh, Lightroom, Photoshop, uh, we're always looking for instructors um, because right now for a lot of our courses we have one instructor with no backup. So for a lot of these we do need backup. 
um, to help alternating these courses and in case an instructor can't make it. So again, it's a great opportunity for someone. Speakers, if you have an interesting trip you went on, or not, or, or just an, an area of interest, astrophotography, and you want to talk one evening to the club, let us know. We'd be glad to have you as a speaker. Um, committee positions, we need a chair of our nature competition. We could use some people on the hospitality commission. So again, these are just, oh, and one more, lest I forget, graphic design. Anyone who has any graphic design experience, we could use you with the website to help out as well. So depending on how much time you want to put in, we're going to really be looking for these. So next week, you'll start to hear a lot more about it. And so this just gives you a little preview tonight. Rescheduled, the nature competition that the blizzard uh, knocked off the calendar will be rescheduled March 22nd. That's a print competition. Dark room door, if you have an area of expertise um, and want to write an article, send us an email to info at clevelandphoto.org and we'll hook you up with the, the right people there. Phone competition, don't forget, I've seen a lot of stuff. In fact, some of the stuff, I, no, not tonight. I've seen some recently pop up. People are starting to use their phones. Start considering this. We're having a phone competition, our first, on May 3rd. So start taking some pictures with the phone so you have stuff to enter. It'll be projection, and it's not part of the competition season, so that we, there will be judging there but this isn't part of the official competition. We're just seeing how much interest there is out there in this. So start thinking about that. The competition survey, the competition committee is rethinking how competitions are done, uh, thinking about dividing maybe the club into expert photographers, regular photographers, beginning photographers, versus keeping it the way it is now. Um, the whole, all of the club members got an email about this with a link to our survey page. The survey will be open for, I think, through the week and whatnot too. So there's still time to express your opinion on that. So uh, again, we'd like to hear from you. Photographic magazines, again, we've always had, but our, our um, collection has been augmented thanks to Bill Keaton, brought in a whole bunch of black and white issues. Remember, the the pictures never outdate. So there's a lot of just great pictures, great just ideas. Help yourself. So those are ones, if you see a magazine and like, you like in the back, just take some home with you. And of course, our um, Friday night meetings, all the public meetings are on our YouTube channel. You get to it by going to our website, clicking on the YouTube icon. When you get to YouTube, click on live, which is counterintuitive there and you'll see all of our presentations uh, there as well. Remember, Zoom presentations are on our website under the member's content because they are not public um, too. So with all of that, now that that's out of the way, I did want to acknowledge one other thing that I sorely never do for when I'm up here. And all of you who are munching popcorn, eating too, I just want to acknowledge, this all comes to you courtesy uh, John Hellman and Bob Kowaleski back there are our popcorn. For years, for years have been making this. And I'm convinced that's probably why half of you are here tonight. So thank you very much then. So we'll get underway with photojournalism. Um, again, the way this works, this is not a competition. The images will go up. If the people are here, they will tell us a bit about their images and explain them as to why they took them, what's the story behind them as well. If they are not here, they usually have submitted something to be read about the picture and we'll have someone read that. So that's how that works tonight. So let's then get underway and bring up our images. They are in alphabetical order by first name because that's how Microsoft does it. So in case you're wondering. So up first we have uh, Bill Keaton. Hello all. Uh, I've been to South Africa a couple times and one of the trips I was down there uh, we've 
traveled to and visited a Zulu village. And this picture is of a young boy and his grandmother, both enjoying a sucker. Uh, that's the thatched roofed house they live in. You can see the smoke coming out. Uh, open fires in the building is how they cook. Um, heat's not really a problem for South Africa. Um, in this village, AIDS years ago had run rampant, and this grandmother is raising her grandchild because both the parents have died. Uh, it's a town of 5,000. One small store serves the whole town. There is one school uh, I got to visit in the group I was in. The classes were as many as 50 kids in a class and a lean-to against a school building with a large cast iron pot or kettle was served as the uh, cafeteria. They just made a soup for the kids in this, like, I'm going to guess it was a 30-gallon cast iron kettle. Um, just makes you wonder about, you know, you hear people complain about things in our life. Just gives you a little perspective. Next one. I call this I Like Blue. <laughs> uh, this was taken during the chalk walk at Oberlin. Uh, except during the COVID years, it's an annual event. It was held June 24th this last summer. Um, this was taken in front of the Allen Art Museum. That's a wide public area, though. To be honest, sidewalks all up and down the downtown area. Uh, you can just, you know, pick an area, grab some chalk, do your thing. They actually bring in some featured artists. And if you have a cloudy or a cloudy bright day, it's a good day to go take pictures of people. You'll always find little kids with chalk streaked faces, that sort of thing. Um, it's just a fun afternoon. Next one. In conjunction with the chalk walk last year, they had a gay pride day. I call this taking a drag. Uh, no pun intended, of course. But this was take, this took place in Tappan Square, which is in the center of Oberlin. And this is one of the performers taking a smoke break uh, during her performance. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's going to continue as part of the chalk walk day or not, but it was a first for last year. Next shot. And this is one of the performers. Uh, it was a sing and dance routine from five or six performers held at the, uh, again, on Tappan Square. This is at the music uh, bandstand. Uh, I just like this shot because of the expression, the feel you get from that, and just the background people even though out of focus. I mean, a guy with his shirt tail out and a cowboy hat sitting with somebody else. It just gives a contrasting look of the uh, things that were going on that day. And that's all I got. Yes. First one, please. Uh, for, for those of us who travel along the lakefront, uh, this is the Avon power plant. And if you know it or not, it, uh, it was a long time landmark for both fishermen and pilots. It was decommissioned a number of years ago. And if you, if you look hard, you will notice that they are now in the throes of demolishing it. Now, I'm, I'm certainly it's going to take them a number of months yet but if if you're interested keep your eye out because they're they're going to take those stacks down with dynamite they're going to blow them down and that would be an awesome opportunity to get a photograph um, but just uh, you know a change in our in, in, in era that was uh, quite 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 a landmark for many people over the years next one What's interesting about this is that uh, uh, a beautiful person running, as you know, in, in Washington, you have to have a great deal of stamina. And uh, here, here's one of our athletes coming out. It's, a, it's amazing uh, how that was the only person, other than those cars in, in, in the background, 
that was uh, easy to see, but uh, just amazing shot cut with her coming through. Next one. Okay, here again, this is Avon. Uh, this is a kayak and small fishing boat launching ramp. And during the summer and certainly the spring and the fall, it's almost impossible to even find a parking lot, uh, in the, a parking spot in the parking lot, or even getting close to this location. What's amazing is this was taken just last week, and, and you can see the stones that were washed up from the storms that came through in the wintertime, but just, just the solace and the, the, the tranquility of the moment. And that's all I have. Very nice. Is, is Bonnie here? Okay, Bonnie says, um, this is Zebra Official. The Al Albuquerque Balloon Festival, held every October, has officials called Zebra Officials. These officials serve as traffic cops who coordinate the launch so the balloons leave the fields in a safe manner. And this one is called Bubble Fun. These kids were having fun chasing bubbles at the balloon festival. Next. Come to me. This little boy desperately wants to catch a bubble. Next. Hi, Dad. I'm here. This little girl was very pleased with herself while playing this trick on her dad. He was watching four-year-olds practice soccer and didn't notice for about five minutes. Brad? Thank you. Hi, so um, I'm Brad Mitchell. Uh, this, um, you'd think I was vacationing in uh, Asia, but actually I took the afternoon off from work and went to the Frist Art Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, this is a uh, Tibetan monks visiting. Uh, they were uh, constructing a mandala. And I was fascinated by this, just the intense concentration this guy had uh, really stood out in my Lightroom uh, archive because the colors and everything. Um, and also, I don't have many pictures of people. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that sand? Is yes. That so yes. that's... It, they they put sand they, in these little wow. pipes and then they run that that um, uh, the stick over the grooves and it comes out in like a pattern into the, and uh, if you go to the next picture you'll see <laughs> this insane pattern on this whole circle the mandala is Sanskrit for circle and basically this it, they use the circle. Uh, artistic pattern as a symbol for uh, the universe and they were there for a week and they worked on it for days constructing this this um, painting and then basically at the end of the week they uh, swept it up into the river as a symbol of uh, the Buddhist concept of impermanence <laughs> So I, I thought that was really, really fascinating. Um, and if you go to the next one, it was just a pit, picture of all the different colors of the, those are the sand, um, basically cups that they use to, to um, construct the mandala. So. Wow, that's fascinating. They, I mean, when they're done with it, they, they sweep it up? They that's just sweep it up, yeah. It, just symbolizing uh, impermanence of wow. the universe. <laughs> Impressive. So. Thanks, Brad. It was uh, Nashville, Tennessee, at the Frist Art Center. They were visiting from Tibet. Thanks, Brad. Wow. Bryant Muhammad? Is Bryant here? Okay. Bryant's picture is called Black and Blue. Two CPD officers escort escorting a young boy with a bicycle at the Labor Day Parade. 
It is unknown what the situation was. I didn't ask. It was an opportunity for an interesting shot. Dave? Nope. Dave Korosek. This is called Chardon Square, April 2023. <clears throat> Our quiet New England style Chardon Square became the setting for a culture class of protesters in April 2023 when a drag show came to town. Police showed up in force with an arm, armored car, a mobile command center, riders on horseback, surveillance cameras, a drone, and rooftop spotters, all to protect the public and the small town charm. Next. This is called A Crusader Reaches Out. A crusader in full Monty Python garb goes med medieval for the religious protester with kettle for helmet, chain mail, and sword. He reaches out to confront the LBGTQ plus protesters dressed in black, concealing their faces and waving rainbow flags. The LBGTQ plus supporters manned a concrete barricade in front of a local restaurant where a ticketed drag show was scheduled to take place. Crusaders speaking to LGBTQ+. The, cru the Crusaders outfit drew much attention and he appeared to be the official spokesman for the religious protesters, regularly crossing the street, separating the two groups quiet to quietly chat with the L LGBTQ+ crowd. They did not respond at all to anything he said. The LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus group had about 20 to 25 people compared to about 15 to 20 on the religious protest side of the street. Both groups combined were way outnumbered by the 40 plus police officers, dozens of photographers, videographers, news reporters, and curious townspeople seeming very nervous to be seen on one side of the sidewalk or the other. Next. Crusader in the Crosswalk. In 1959, then Senator John F. Kennedy visited the Maple Festival in Chardon and rode down this very street in an open convertible sedan. The Crusader, after not being able to stir up much of an action from the drag show supporters, crossed back to the religious side of the street under the watchful eye of the rooftops spotted in military tactical gear just weeks before this similar event took place in Wadsworth where the uh, two groups were more vocal and some pushing and shoving broke out. Next. Clergy with, proton with pronoun sign. Several local clergy stood in support of the LGBT, LGBTQ plus side and the business hosting the drag show. There was no violence at all. The religious protesters used a bullhorn to communicate their message to all. Next. Patriot Front, Patriot Front arrives. Just as the protests looked to be winding down, a squad of six to seven members of a group called Patriot Front arrived in large pickup trucks on the square and set up on the religious protesters' side of the street. According to uh, Wikipedia, they split off from, from other alt-right and fascist organizations in the aftermath of the Charlottesville events in 2017. The religious protesters who were on scene did not welcome them and proclaimed that the Patriot Front was not with them. Next. Janice confronts Patriot Front. The LGBTQ plus side had an unofficial ambassador who, nicknamed, who was nicknamed Janice. Like the Crusaders, she regularly crossed the street and fearlessly confronted the religious protesters in between singing lines of John Lennon, Imagine, and Give Peace a Chance. Patriot Front was not prepared for the rain that quickly moved in. They hastily packed up their flags and gear 
and they actually ran to their trucks to avoid getting wet. Someone taunted them by saying, are you afraid of a little rain? I guess they don't make Nazis like they used to. Joe? Okay. This is called Sunrise. This photo was taken during the blue hour, just before sunrise, on Marco Island, Florida. The gentleman was using a rather modest fishing pole in a vast and unfriendly sea. Next. Caught. These fishermen were working the shoreline at Marco Island, Florida, near sunset. This image caused me to wonder what it would be like if the net were coming toward the fishermen instead of it being, it being tossed from the boat. Next. Long walk. This image was taken on the sand dunes in Death Valley, California. Who made these footprints? And did, it, did, it, did they reach the distant summit? And that's it for Joe. John? Nope. Tiger mom with tiger club, tiger cubs. This photo taken at our Cleveland Metro Park Zoo illustrates the bond between a tiger and her newborn cubs. It reminds us of the universal nature of maternal love and protection. Note the tender gaze of the mother, Zoya, as she leans closely to her three-month-old and yet unnamed tiger cub, born this past November 6th. The tiger cubs made their public debut on January 31st. There's a strong sense of nurturing from Zoya as the cub simply looks out into the new world with curiosity. There a sense of confidence, maybe because mom is right there beside her. Tiger dad without family. This photo is of the father of the tiger cubs, Hector. He is separated from his family by this chain link fence. We learned that this is necessary precaution to ensure the safety of two newborn cubs. Hector was roaring constantly while looking in the direction of this family. It seemed like he was crying and wanted to be with his family, especially his children. In researching this further, male tigers do not typically engage in the rearing of their young. The presence of the father in close proximity to the cubs can pose a risk and potentially lead to aggression. While my girlfriend and I were leaving the tiger wildlife area, we had watched the cubs for over an hour and had a deeper understanding and respect for tigers and their family interactions. At the same time, we found ourselves discussing the challenges and ethics of keeping animals in captivity. Then again, it is likely that the tigers were analyzing us also. John? End of a landmark, Cleveland, on fire, Cleveland fire on scene at Sturley's fire. And that's it for John. What was uh, Sturley's? Is that, does anyone know? Restaurant. It, it was a German restaurant? Mm-hmm. Okay. <coughs> Kenneth Hubble? Okay. Kenneth says, defending the goal. Youth soccer player defending his team's goal. Short and to the point. And this is Kim no. Vajileski. You got it right. Okay. <laughs> Just in case you weren't sure. <laughs> That's Kim for you. The tree lighting in Strongsville, Ohio is always spectacular. I was drawn more to the crowd and their faces while watching the fireworks. Uh, just the wonder and concentration pull, pull me in. 
Now those look, for those of you who don't know, those younger ones too, those are like antique things she's wearing. Those are the old, looks like C9 bulbs. Not the little tiny one, that's the, that's the biggies. Did I write anything worthwhile here? Oh, well, this is a picture that I took not from the roof but from the window. Um, my flat roof had to be replaced, and the roofing company picked a day that was 10 degrees above zero to do it. Um, they had, it was interesting, they had four men up on that little flat roof Two of them had those flamethrowers. I know that's not the name of it, but uh, they had the. And as they unrolled the roofing, they were melting the underside of it, which would then stick to the roof. Um, I thought it was really pretty interesting. I took a number of pictures, but I like this one because it showed the flames, and there he is balanced on the edge of the roof uh, in a precarious way. Yeah. They also were kind of joshing with one another up there, you know, pushing one another, and I thought, oh, my goodness, all right. But you're inside, though. I'm inside. I'm not on the roof. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> we had that one wonderful snow. I think this has been really a dreadful winter. and No snow at all, but that was just beautiful. And in no time, my next-door neighbor came over, and shoveled my, all my walks. And I just wanted to laud and applaud him, and I think it certainly caught him in the middle of shoveling. This was an interesting memorial service at the Nature Center at Shaker Heights. It was a friend of mine who died, and the upstairs rooms were filled with people. Um, she was an older woman, um, but lively, and so a lot of the goings-on at this memorial service were lively. And this long log was sitting on a table in the room, in the upper room at the uh, Nature Center. Uh, but, it, you know, in front of it were all the pictures of her. And then at some point at the end of the service, the family all came and picked this up and walked it down the stairs and out the, law, out the outside and down into the woods. And I happened to still be upstairs and caught this picture. Um... I think they had a little service down in the woods, and then they brought it back and took it. I think came down here to Brexville somewhere, anyway. So it was something that was in the family, and I don't know, maybe her ashes were in that somewhere? But I thought it was an interesting story. I volunteer at the food bank once a month. Um, it's the most incredible place, if anybody hasn't been there. Um, it's clean, uh, it's so well organized, and there are some of the most beautiful pictures painted on the walls. But this is one of the workers, there you can see them all sorting through the boxes that are sent to the, to the uh, food bank and then eventually put in these bins different things. This happened to say sauces and other things on the outside. But they have all manner of things. They get distributed into different boxes and then um, are available to be boxed and taken to where trucks can take them to homeless shelters, churches where they're distributed, uh, food banks, Anyway, I did want to include that. And if anybody has time, you could go. It's on Coit Road up in Cleveland. They welcome um, volunteers. This was a, a, bull, a billboard 
in New York City. And I just entered it because I think the message is so current and so with humor. Um, and it's a good way to advertise. I'm here. Um, these are just a few of the shots that I had, um, just segueing into my talk next week on Jordan. I, a few months ago, was in Jordan, which is, which is very, very interesting and different than a, a, just a lot of the countries I've traveled in. Uh, and this is down in the Petra area. Now, Petra, all Petra is, it's a giant slot canyon, like Antelope Canyon out west. Um, before you go into it, things are kind of wide. Then it gets down to about 20 feet across. Um, you are, it's located towards the middle of Jordan. And what's interesting, as you get farther south in Jordan, the more desert you get. In Jordan, most of the travel up north around Amman and whatnot is by car and what, car, bus. As you get towards the middle, you see a lot more animal transportation, uh, people on camels, horses, whatnot, too. And as you get to the southern part, it is almost exclusively, because of the desert, um, animal travel as well. Um, but the color palette is very interesting there as well. Everyone is kind of dressed in brown. These are just some workers taking a break. Dressed in brown, the sides are brown. But very interesting. I've been traveling over the years, and I do mostly travel photography, people photography there. And what's become more difficult over the years, and I realized it as I was going through my last batch of photographs, is that almost, I'd say, 70% of the people that I get candids of have phones up. Everybody's got a phone. I mean, this used to be rare before, but you look, these guys, phone, 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 phone. The kids have, a, you get a picture, cute kid you see over there. You take a picture, he's got a phone he's looking at as well. So it's a really interesting phenomenon, no matter where you are, in the middle of nowhere, they're just, as I went through my pictures, oh, I can't use it because he's got a phone in, he's got a phone in this one. It really becomes a, a problem. But I, this was just an interesting picture. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And also I've lost the ability to, to just kind of imagine and just, just think things too. I mean, you constantly are on, uh, on, on phone looking at something. Um, this is at the, uh, the uh, base of the treasury building. Um, what's interesting there is always, rather than the, the actual building itself, I always like to look around at the people. There is always a sub-economy going, especially in tourist areas. A lot of these men have, uh, have camels and whatnot. You could pay to ride on them around in a little circle there. Notice the phone again. I stopped trying to take them out of the picture uh, as well. But what is amazing is you, I'm telling you, I live in Strongsville. I have trouble sometimes with reception and internet. You're in the middle of Jordan in the 20, it's a slot canyon that goes up hundreds of feet. Their connection is better than I have ever, ever seen as well. So somehow in the middle of nowhere, you're right, we're talking about animal travel and everything else like that. There is top-notch cell reception. I mean, I don't think anyone could live without it. Again, up. Notice the phones uh, there too. But again, you'll see a lot of the locals uh, in the tourist areas especially are, uh, again, have the camels around and whatnot, hawking their wares. Notice the Arab dress. This is not the kafia, by the way, is not a political symbol. You will see tons of kafias there. Kafia is basically very, very functional. It's to keep the, uh, the, the flies and the dust and the heat off you. Um, you'll see a lot of red and white ones there um, in Jordan, too. And there is no significance to the, you'll see different colors of the, of the bands on top. And the bands, the significance of the bands are just there to hold the kafia on the head. So there's no real significance to the number of them or the type. 
And in the old days, you notice it's important. It's part of the dress, too. You come across animals. You notice the knife tucked there uh, as well. However, next to the knife is the phone. So you could, you could attack the animal and call 911 at the same time there, too. But I just thought, as I went through my pictures, I thought pointing out, because not that I'd be looking for it, but the more you look in these, you just, it is kind of universal now as well. Uh, a lot of animal travel here, too. This is just one of the locals there. Travel by donkey is very, very common. They're very easy to raise, easy to keep. They don't demand much, and things are really steep there. So there's a lot of just travel on, uh, on donkeys there as well. And you can see the steep things, a lot of the provisions, uh, the bottled water and stuff they bring down is all by the donkeys and whatnot up these steep trails uh, again. And you'll notice the kafias again, which is just part of the desert wear, which is again highly functional. Uh, interesting that you notice again, this is not part, these are residents that live there and travel through these areas. You know, this is not the ideal thing to drive a, a truck or a car and whatnot. And most people travel by camel. And that is the mode of transportation um, that you'll find about half the people using down in the middle part, and it comes to uh, almost all of them down in the southern part of Jordan. So just a very interesting uh, way of life and a landscape down there. And I think that's it. Do I have? No, you get, and again, horseback. Uh, a lot of these roads, you see horsebacks on with the, the modern, you know, the, the blue sunglasses and whatnot. <laughs> And again, kafias of all type. This is just a black headdress on, but it's hot. On uh, these days, it's 100, 110. You're out in the desert. And so again, even though those look like they would be warm encompassing you, they keep the sun off your head and they are actually uh, very, very cool. So that's just a little bit of taste of, uh, of Petra. Sasan al Haddad? No? Is Sasan here? Okay. <clears throat> this is called contrast. I couldn't help noticing the contrast between the two women. The one who was sitting spoke of poverty and isolation. I wanted to know her story. Next. This is called Homeward Bound. India's train stations are a feast for the eyes. While we Westerners needed a guide just to find the correct entrance, humanity milled about us. This woman in a train station near Delhi is dressed in the attire of the furthest area of Raj Rajasthan. Next. This is called Latte. Outside the Tibetan market in Udapur, I stopped to rest. I had a latte served from the most historical coffee machine I had ever seen. It was good. Next. Mendicants. The city of Pushkar in India is a holy site for Hindus. We visited during a pilgrimage and cattle fair. I came across this group early in the morning while walking in the fairgrounds. And that's all for Sasan. Wally? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, I, had the, I was fortunate enough to live in the Middle East for six years, and I did some uh, news work there and uh, documentary work. And um, so when the Egyptian Revolution came, you know, I had to go and take pictures of it. I'm not a, a conflict photographer, but uh, I figured it's happening in my own backyard and it's a, a, pretty sig a pretty significant thing happening, so I went out there. Uh, and yeah, yeah, these are some of the pictures. Uh, when when was this? 
This was in 2011. In 2011. Yep. That was actually in Libya, uh, in Benghazi, uh, when they were still looking for Gaddafi. Wow, oh, and what were you, you were in the, what were you doing? Uh, yeah, these are fascinating. I'm a, so, I did photography for some news agencies and so on, uh, basically freelance. Fascinating. This is back in Cairo. This is in Cairo. These are s some of the Sudanese refugees uh, that came to Cairo uh, who now live there, but they live basically as, as outcasts. The, the government won't help them find jobs and don't allow them to get jobs, and they can't go back to... South Sudan, because you know what they had there is gone. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty tough uh, situation for them. Wow, that that was that was fascinating. I think that's it. Then that is all of our images. <coughs> yes. Wait, 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 wait. Mariah's got Mariah's got the chair. Uh, to the one go. Where the two policemen have. Could oh. we go back to the one with the two policemen and the little boy in the bike? I mean, we went by it so quickly. I think it, it, I just wanted to look at it. Um, I know which one you mean. It was there, it was right there. Yes. This was by Brian Muhammad's one. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't know what that story. That was is. yeah, black and blue. He, he called this one, and and he said he thought it was an interesting picture. You know, he didn't know the exact circumstances, but he thought it just visually was good, so he just took it and. I thought as a photojournalism picture, it's dynamite. That's really. Yeah. Yep. So great yeah, images. So. I, I really thank everyone for entering, and uh, you know, please, we have another one coming up in a few weeks. You can enter up to seven. It's you know, we, we just love to see the images. So anything that tells a story, please just send them in right through uh, Shutterscore. So thank you all for uh, for coming tonight.